Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As most of you are probably aware now, um, especially in your context in particular, that pastors don't really retire. <laughs> Because why? Well, you don't retire from a divine call. How do you retire from a divine call? It's like uh, Abraham, you know, uh, finally said, you know, hey, I'm over 100. I'm, I'm done, okay? Eliezer's going to inherit everything, right? And God said, eh, no, that's not my plan. How about Ishmael? No, no, that's not my plan either. Once you have a call on your life, that call on your life is forever, and whatever it might be. And certainly, I, I think Christian pastors sometimes have that also feeling that uh, you don't really retire. Uh, and, and really, when you think about it, I've, I've often heard some evangelists and some uh, uh, preachers say, there really is no such thing as retirement uh, in Scripture. You can't really find retirement in Scripture. As long as we are breathing and healthy and, and God's people and gifted, we're to be working, we're to be doing something, working at something for the kingdom of God. And so I think we're going to, I'm going to change it from now on and, and say the pastors don't retire. Right, Andrew? Pastors don't retire. But they kind of just transition. Okay. We kind of just go into a transition in which we transition to something else. That is a calling on our life. For that's what most pastors do. Uh, they step back from perhaps full-time parish ministry from teaching or from administrative work. Uh, to pursue the next passion that the Holy Spirit has put on their heart, uh, the next passion for Christ. And uh, you'll know that from, from many uh, pastors that you've known in the past uh, and you have uh, worked with over the years in the uh, uh, storied history of this congregation. So, uh, so I, I think that as we think about that, then we, we think about, well, is there a calling... Uh, to move beyond where I am right now? Or am I, am I going to bask in the past? Or is there a calling on me now, today, that I feel is compelling, that is leading me to tomorrow? As I was speaking with the children, you know, after you've accomplished an uh, iron kid, where do you go from there, right? Uh, after you've got your medal hanging on your wall in your, in your bedroom, where do you go from there, you know? What do you do next, okay? And so it is with us. After we have made the accomplishments, we, we, whether we, it's, it's, the, it's the bonus or the gold watch or whatever it might be, where do we go from here? And I think that's what we want to talk about today. The, um, immediately, we want to put ourselves in a position where we can ask ourselves what's next. I can remember, I can remember uh, 12 and a half years ago. 12 and a half years ago, I was standing with a couple of men from the area in front of of a uh, absolutely dilapidated, derelict uh, mission hospital in Chirala, India. And I can remember one of the men uh, that I was standing there with saying, uh, saying to me that he thought it was impossible that, this, that anything would happen. And uh, I'm standing there in front of this building and I'm thinking, well, what is God calling this community? Because it would have to be, obviously, out of that community. But what is he calling me and those who would uh, uh, have the same feeling towards this mission as I? What are we being called to? Well, it was uh, a nearly a forgot forgotten locale. Uh, but literally, in the old days, this particular facility that we were looking at served hundreds of thousands of people. Tens of thousands of babies were born there. It was an incredible and important mission station and mission facility under the direction of a very faithful and wonderful pair of sisters, uh, Lutheran women, uh, uh, Mary and Emma Bear. So even though they thought it was impossible that this would ever rise again and become anything, we decided that we would simply step out in prayer much prayer. We would do some planning. We would take and courageously uh, uh, find people who were willing to see the vision. Would they be willing to come along with us? Could they be convinced in Christ that this is where they're being led? And we began solely then on faith that it was God's in Christ that was calling us to do something with this mission. 
So today, nearly 13 years later from that initial event, uh, where we decided to first start with the clinic near the road, then move on to the hospital and do something there. By faith in God's continued provision uh, to minister, we have had and delivered hands-on practical health care and met the needs of nearly 200,000 people in 13 years. And besides that, we have also facilitated the evangelism of an additional 150,000 people. Simply because we decided that God was compelling us in His Spirit to move forward. And to not look behind. Not even to consider the great and, and, and prestigious history of this mission hospital when it was first founded in 1909, when the building was built in 1912, and all the marvelous things that had gone on there, the expansions that it made in the 1940s and 50s, and instead to look at what we can do with God's power and grace right now. Right now. And so by the same power and grace in which we began, uh, we will open now uh, a nursing college. We're on, on track to open a nursing college there at that very same place so nurses can be trained not only for that particular area but also to help with our rural ministry uh, by delivering uh, health care in the rural ministries. I once read a, a saying uh, from an essay by Robert Hastings uh, that goes something like this. It isn't the burdens of today that drive men mad. It isn't the burdens of, the, of today that drive men mad. And, and that drive men mad is, 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 a, is a, an analogy, metaphor. Rather, it is regret over yesterday or fear of tomorrow. Regret and fear are twin thieves who would rob us of today. Rob us of today. We have today all the grace sufficient for today. Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount. Each day has enough trouble for itself. You have enough of what is needed for each day. God has provided. And we, we say that in the Lord's Prayer, do we not? Give us this day our daily bread. We know what that means. It means our whole provision for life for that day. And we trust God to the Why? Because He's our Father. And so we trust that. Those of us called in baptism to be children of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, our life is to be lived and it's to be lived without regrets for yesterday and without fears for tomorrow. We simply, those can do nothing for us today. They can do nothing for us today. I had a wise pastor once say, what's in the past is under God's grace. What is in the future is under His providence. And what you have today is a present. It's the present. We have a present from God today. And he, He's given us everything we need for this day because we're His children. So why allow us to be uh, shackled, held back uh, by regrets of, over which things we cannot change, or tomorrow, which is, again, under His provision, His providence. Life is entirely too short and entirely, of course, too precious under God's calling in Christ to live in regrets or to have the paralysis of fear, being afraid to, to move out. And I think that that was... As we said, and I understood, these men lived in this community. They lived in this community. And they were, uh, they were in their 30s. So they saw the, the slow deterioration over those 30 years. They saw it happen and, and seemed powerless to do anything about it. So I understood those, but we couldn't live there anymore. I kept trying to encourage them. For a child of God, he is, he is the God of today and the God of tomorrow. And we live in His presence for the holy purposes for which He's called us. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Where you, you are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do the works which He's prepared beforehand you should do. That's where we live. We live by, uh, by uh, grace, through faith, in that provision. So, Paul said it this way in Philippians chapter 3, one of my favorite verses of the, of the, uh, of the Bible, certainly of the New Testament. He says here in Philippians chapter 3, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. That's what he says. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And he goes on to say, 
One thing I do, forgetting what is behind, I am straining for what is ahead to the upward calling from God in Christ Jesus. The heavenly calling, some translations say. The heavenly callings of God in Christ Jesus. Paul, that was his attitude. His attitude is, I press on. I press on. Paul was always looking for the next mission, the next place he could evangelize. Paul often said, I don't want to build on somebody else's stuff, on somebody else's ministry. If their ministry is there, fantastic. And he would visit and encourage, but he was always looking for that next outpost. He was always looking for that next opportunity where God was calling him to do something that would have to be done in the power and provision of God. That they were not, the person himself or herself or the group was not in themselves capable of, but knew that with God all things are possible and were willing in faith to step out. I mean, if you're going to fail at something for God, fail big. You know, why, why do we just want, well, I'm, I'm failing all these little things, maybe I shouldn't try anything big. If you're going to fail, fail big then. God is, if He's in it, He's in it. If He's not, He'll show you that too. But we don't live in discouragement. We continue to move forward. Paul had um, all the right characteristics in his own life. He had all the right characteristics of being a Pharisee's Pharisee, which he himself confessed in Acts chapter uh, 23, verse 6. That of all the Pharisees, he was one of the greatest ones, right? He had all the right stuff in Judaism. He had all the education, all the upbringing, all the tremendous schooling and the teachings of the, of the, of the rabbis. He knew the Talmud. He, he had all of this stuff. He was uh, a, a, uh, a fluent Greek speaker, a fluent Hebrew speaker, a fluent Aramaic speaker, and a fluent, and he, I don't know if he was fluent in Latin, but he could, could probably get along just fine in Latin. He was a, he was a genius. He was an incredible man. But he simply obeyed the calling of God when on the road to Damascus he said, you are persecuting me. Now you get up and go in the city. I'll show you what you do because you'll have to suffer many things to be my servant to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. And he obeyed it. He obeyed. He obeyed. Yet, he called that in Philippians. All the schooling he had, everything he had, after that experience on the, Damascus, on the road to Damascus, in Acts. When he had that experience, it's to the Philippians he would later wrap, I consider it all rubbish. All of that was rubbish. His past, all that was back there, he had no regrets. He left it with no regrets. He put that aside to move forward to where God was calling him. For too long, perhaps, we have dwelt in the should have done's. Paul came to the focus not of what he should have been or might have been. He came to the point of Christ. Christ where there was no longer any regrets of the past. No longer any, I forgot to do this or I didn't do that or beating himself up about a mistake that was made. He simply obeyed the calling of the heaven, heavenward call in Christ Jesus. We are all on a path. We're all on a path. And I, I think path, paths are a couple of ways. There's two ways you can be on a path. You can be on a path proactively where you're really looking for something. I mean, you really got your eyes open. You're looking for opportunity. Or you can be on a path being carried along. Just carried along. So the mass is going this way. The mass of the people or whatever. And I just move that. The culture goes this way. I just go that way. It's the way the culture's going. Mostly with our eyes closed. Mostly keeping our eyes on, on our, uh, what is Pokemon Go or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> you know, and we just kind of go off, you know, and, and we're not paying any attention. Okay? No vision, no tomorrow in Christ. And we can't be living like that. We, we have to understand that we do have to be counterculture. We do have to be counterculture. I remember a cartoon, a good friend of mine, a, a president of the congregation I once served, uh, he was an elder of the congregation too. Eventually came, uh, became the godfather of my youngest son. He always had a little cartoon that he kept posted up. This little cartoon in his house. Kind of framed it, put it there. B.C. You all know the B.C. comic strip, right? B.C. So there's, there's some character in the B.C. comic strip. I don't know what his name is. But he's always sticking his head in the river and seeing what the fish are doing. 
first ichthyologist, I guess, in, in ancient history. But he stick his head. So he's sticking his head in the river, and there's this one fish, and this one fish is going is going against the stream. He's swimming against the stream. You've all heard that expression, you know, don't go against the stream. But he's swimming against the stream. And all these fish that are going past him are saying, Well, you idiot, turn around. What do you think you're doing? Get out of the way. You know? And in the very last scene, you know, he keeps going just like it was. In the very last scene, all these fish are going over a waterfall. <laughs> you know? So are you going to be carried along, just carried along, wherever it may lead you? Or is it going to be something like St. Paul is saying, Look, I've got an upward calling in God to go to Jesus Christ in heaven. That's the path I'm on. Who should I be listening to? Who should I have my eyes on? As Hebrews said, the author and perfecter of your faith, Jesus Christ. And that's who Paul had his eyes on. He was reaching forward. Forward to things in front of it. Far too long, perhaps, we have dwelt with the should have dones and the wish I hads, you know. Well, they're gone. And they're under grace. They're forgiven. They're thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. You're the only one that can bring them back up again. God has said He'd forget them. It's like the old Italian race car driver. You know, a lot, you, you remember the cross-country races they have in Europe. Well, this American decided he was going to team up with, a, with an Italian. He couldn't get any Americans to do it, but he wanted to do it. He thought it would be fun to do this uh, three, three or four hundred mile tour uh, rally race in Europe. So he's in the car and he's kind of looking at the map and he's getting all ready. And this very jovial, uh, happy Italian comes and he opens up the door and he jumps in behind the driver's seat of the car, you know, and he, and he looks around and he so he introduces himself as Giovanni whoever. And the first thing he does is he grabs the rearview mirror and he pulls it off and throws it in the back seat. And the guy said, what are you doing? And the Italian turned and said, what is it behind of me? It makes no difference. <laughs> That's going to be our attitude. What is it behind of me? It makes no difference. That was Paul's attitude. It's all rubbish. Let's move on. Let's get into where God is calling us. Let's go where He wants us to go. It's all under grace. It's all under God's economy of forgottenness. I suppose nothing can get us quite as out of step with the Holy Spirit's guidance than dwelling on yesterday's failures and defeats. That's not where the Spirit is leading. That's not where He wants you to go. Does it mean we don't learn from it? Of course not. Everybody brings their scars and their experiences to each day. We all do. But today, allow yourself to be reminded that Jesus Christ is not only the God of your right now, but He is also and particularly the God of your tomorrow. If there is a tomorrow, He's the God of it, just like He's the God now. And the God in your life through every step of your life up to now. And although He may not be calling you into the slums of Hyderabad to deal with the thousands, literally tens of thousands of underserved children, and though He is not asking you to leave the comfort of your home to go to a, uh, uh, or your neighborhood or your friends or your family or anything that is around you, to travel to some distant place. A friend of mine is, is going to do a mission. In, uh, he's retired from pastoral ministry. He's now going to go do a mission in northern Philippines. You're not being called there to enhance the you know, uh, life of, of indigenous peoples there. That's not what you're being called to. Perhaps. Maybe you are. I know the first trip I ever took to India was led by a man that was 80 years old. So maybe some of you are being led to do something that way. He's calling you to open your eyes, calling you to begin to envision what He is able to do in your midst with the very resources you have in your hands right now. The very resources you have in your hands right now. He has resourced you. And He has gifted you in the Spirit. What are they? You have them now. Give them an assessment. Discern with the Spirit. Is leading. In Luke chapter 9, our Lord said to those listening, 
No man having put his hand to the plow and then looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Think about that now. The man having put his hand to the plow but looks back has not, is not fit. Now the word fit there is an interesting word. That's an interesting word in Greek. Uh, the word fit there means well placed. He's uh, adapted. He's, he's ready for use. That's what the word fit means. Somebody ready for use. It's like the person that, it's, it's like when I was a kid playing, uh, well, young man. When I was a young man playing football. So when I was a young man playing football, I remember getting hurt in a game. And uh, so I was taken off to the side. And uh, it, was, it was just a trolley horse or maybe a little bit of a sprain. It wasn't a big deal. And uh, so I was, you know, uh, the trainer was working on me for a little while. And I was feeling, and so the coach comes over and says, are you ready to go back in? You see, that's being fit. In other words, you could have said, are you fit? <laughs> you know, are you ready to go back in? That's what the word means. It means being ready. When he used the phrase in Luke 14, the word fit, it was with regard to salt. It regards, with regard to salt, he says, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, it loses its salt, then what is it good for? It's neither good to be thrown out or to be walked up near me, and that's all it's good. That's, but the word for what we say good for is the word fit. What's it fit for? Okay? You are not salt without flavor, unless you want to be. You've been salted with the Holy Spirit. You've been salted with the Word of God. You've been salted by Christ. To be a salt unto the world. You are fit, if you will be, to get in the game. To be ready. To adapt to the circumstances that the Word of God does indeed increase. If Jesus felt this strongly then about those who looked back in remorse or regret about what they were leaving behind... I believe he feels just as strongly on the positive side about those who constantly live in the works which God prepared beforehand you should walk in. Ephesians chapter 2.10. He's just as positive in his uh, passion for those of us who have heard the word, have hidden it in our hearts, and have equipped ourselves for the works of mission and ministry. We all ought to leave the community that I called If Only Bill. Get out of If Only Bill. Don't live there anymore. You don't have to. We need to press on towards our heavenly calling in Christ Jesus. And there's no secret to pushing forward. There's no big secret to it. Like you have to have some special formula that you know only a few people have. You don't have to have that to, to move forward, to leave only, uh, If Only Bill behind and to move ahead. You don't need that. It says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, this morning in our text, to encourage us to hold on to Jesus, who is what? The same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Have you ever stopped to think if He's brought you to this moment, do you not think He can carry you through? I mean, I, I, I look along this congregation, I know some of your history. I know some of your history. I came that close to being shot once. Bullet missed me. Okay? I mean, I, I came that close to being literally, literally destroyed in an automobile accident. Just missed it. Okay? Do you not think that he has brought me along this far? That he's just going to leave me here to flounder around with the best I can do? No. He'll take me into tomorrow. And with the same passion that He has placed on my heart that people hear the good news about Jesus Christ. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And if He got me through all that I've been through, which is not, you know, it's not all that tragic or horrible, but it's, it's stuff nonetheless, then He's going to see you through all the way to the end in His purposes that He has set aside that you should do. Now the mission is right in front of you. It's right in front of you. Now, somebody said, well, what is my mission? What is our mission? Let's think of ourselves as a church here. What is our mission? What is our mission? It's right in front of you. Parochially, it's right here. In front of you. 
It's our early childhood learning center in which we impact the lives of young people with the love and encouragement of Jesus Christ while teaching them. In our neighborhood, it's right here with the PRC. Everything we do there in order to encourage young women and, and save children's lives. Statewide, of course, is the network to all of our congregations to work together with Lutheran Services of Georgia in order to bring literally hands-on benefit to people to people who are in great need in our community. And you're part of that, or can be. Nationally, it is our personal commitment to the training of pastors by our, our support of Vicar Joe. But it can be other things that we're doing in supporting our missions, and that's our international, our international outreach providing resources for various evangelistic uh, enterprises, various medical things for doctors and evangelists in Telangana and Andhra Pradesh, India, which has kind of become the focus of our international work as, as a church. I mean, it's, it's individual churches that are helping us. There's no big national movement here, but we are moving out internationally. So it's there in front of you. It, it's not hidden. The calling uh, in any of these areas can be on your life if you will listen to what the Spirit is leading. For Jesus is not only the author and the perfecter of our faith for today, but for all of our tomorrows as well, because He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. If Jesus is in fact the same, then He's God's all-in-all -all provision for us. All our faithful mission and ministry are guaranteed under Christ. He said to his disciples, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. And he says, be as gentle as doves, but be as clever as serpents. And he meant that not in a, uh, he meant that not in a uh, negative way, serpent there, but he merely meant as just rep the reptile we know as a snake. He says, be clever like them. Be clever like them. Be gentle like a dove. And allow the Word of God to work through you. I'm sending you out there. It won't be easy. There's wolves out there. But I'm sending you out there, and, and you're going to be okay. A dove cannot be pounced on by a wolf. It flies away. It gets away from it. You know? A snake is, is not going to be snuck up on. Right? So he said, be smart. And then another time he said to them, do not, when you go, don't take an extra bag. Don't take an extra cloak. If you go into somebody's house and say shalom, peace, and the peace of God is in that house, stay with them. God will provision you through them. And as He does, then move forward. It's all part of this enterprise that Christ is doing in and through His church. So we all ought to, to heed the words of Paul, forgetting what is behind I strain towards what is ahead. And the word strain there towards what is ahead means to really, really be making an effort for what is ahead. Really be making an effort in that direction uh, is what it means. Uh, now is the time, I think, to let Christ uh, become the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Let that peace of God, therefore, that passes our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, even to life everlasting. Amen.